Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I have gotten so much good response from you guys back on reviewing Dr. Campbell's new book called Whole Rethinking the Science of Nutrition and I've said this a couple times before but I've really enjoyed reviewing the book to get these points that I'm relating to you because it's really filtering into the discussions I'm having both at my lectures and with individuals on the topic of health and diet and research and that sort of thing. So we're going to pick up where we left off today, and, um, but before, just a couple of announcements. Fall semester starts in three weeks. Get yourself registered. Don't wait till the last minute. And fall conference featuring Dr. Campbell, November 8th through 10th. You don't want to miss it. Registrations are coming in every day. We're going to sell out this conference, so don't wait till the end. All right, so last week we were talking about reductionist research and um, how this results in products and like drugs and supplements and um, that don't really solve any problems, just deal with symptoms, not cures. And so I'll pick up there. Campbell says once those products hit the market, professional groups and fundraising organizations also get involved in this whole mix. They collect money and they develop public support to contribute even more money to fuel all of this inaccurate business that goes on. We therefore, as consumers, don't really have free choice, but rather make choices within a carefully controlled system in which all of the options that we're given are equally ineffective. And of course, you guys that are watching this are exempted from the ineffective options. You know better because you have the privilege of belonging to the Wellness Forum and listening to people like me and John McDougall who uh, tell you the other, the other side of the story. Campbell doesn't think, by the way, that the negative outcomes are the goal of the system, but just a natural byproduct of its dysfunction. I mean, when you take a look at how screwed up it is, it's amazing probably that it isn't worse. He reminds us, however, and I've been saying this for years, consumers fund the system by the choices they make. And one of the ways to change things is to start making different choices. And that ranges from not buying supplements to going to different types of doctors to investing your money in better foods. He just thinks that, uh, he also states that he's not against capitalism. I think that's really an important thing to say too, that the problem isn't profit motive. I mean, you know, you have to make money doing whatever it is that you're doing, but he thinks profit and doing the right thing can be compatible. And I agree. And there are a lot of people in our field, including the wellness farm, that uh, seem to be able to do well economically and do the right thing. The problem with trying to combine profit and doing the right thing is that reductionist approaches and solutions are easier than holistic ones. In other words, if you're taking pills to lose weight and reduce the risk of heart attack, that's a lot more attractive to many people, particularly if they're not given all of the right information than changing their diet. But magic solutions only address symptoms and not causes. Causes are a lot more complex and they require individuals to take a lot more responsibility. And I'm convinced that individuals will take responsibility, but we have to have a link discussion with them about why. In other words, if they drank the Kool-Aid and they think that statin drugs and blood pressure medications are going to protect them from uh, ill health, then they have no reason to change their diet. But if they understand that that doesn't work, the incentives become greater to do the right thing. Campbell discusses what he calls subtle power, which has been expertly used like or by organizations like the dairy industry, which spends huge amounts of money lobbying the government to promote dairy foods to children, get them hooked as consumers when they're really little, to get farming subsidies and to advertise to consumers. The dairy industry also contributes large sums of money to health-related nonprofits like the Osteoporosis Foundation so that they will recommend dairy products to their members and their consumers. Um, it pays for research to promote its point of view. Schools can buy milk and, and it's really cheap. They don't have to fill out any paperwork because it's the default beverage. Every kid gets milk. This type of subtle power is enjoyed by a lot of different um, organizations and the particularly agricultural organizations and major large food companies. But it's not limited to food. There's a great deal of power enjoyed, subtle power enjoyed by the drug companies and the medical profession. And Campbell's real careful here not to indict everyone. He states he personally knows many doctors who are ethical and operate outside the system, including his own son. But again, the system is set up to encourage the wrong behavior, and the dysfunction that results is a natural byproduct. So he gives some examples of the subtle type of power that groups have. One is physician training, which focuses on pharmaceutical and surgical solutions to disease, which are extremely profitable. And of course, physician, physician training is influenced heavily by the pharmaceutical companies. I've written about this in the past too. Referrals from doctor to doctor. Many specialists are often involved in taking care of the same person, which just pads the bill and adds to the expense. 
predictable results. He talks about getting a second opinion, opinion, which is often nothing more than confirming the recommendations given by the first doctor, since they're all trained to look at things within the same paradigm. One thing I've cautioned people about for years is if you're going to get a second opinion, get a second opinion from somebody who does something different than the guy you got the first opinion from. And people don't do that. They go from one orthopedic surgeon to another, get told the same procedure is a good idea and end up having it instead of going to somebody who doesn't use surgical techniques in order to resolve that very same issue. And then the drug companies. The drug industry, which is, and he says this, is so skilled at pretending to be good while manipulating the public's emotions. Drug companies promote the idea that they invest in research to develop life-saving drugs, the profits of which are invested in more research, which should make us all feel good about paying high prices for drugs and taking a lot of them. The reality is that most of the drugs are useless and many are harmful, but that's not all. The research that the drug companies do is heavily subsidized and funded by tax dollars and also by nonprofit organizations like the American Cancer Society. Even the cost of developing drugs is inflated and misrepresented to the public. The drug companies state that it takes $1.32 billion to bring a drug to market. Um, the actual expense, and this will shock you, is close to 70 million, much of which is subsidized. This misrepresentation of expense is due to a whole lot of factors, including the fact that the drug companies routinely inflate the numbers of subjects that are participating in clinical trials and the expense of those subjects. When you look at National Institutes of Health data, you get a whole completely different story. Drug companies are not only permitted to advertise to the public directly, we're only one of two countries that does that, New Zealand you can do it, and here in the United States, but the drug companies spend an average of $61,000 per doctor per year educating physicians about their products. And educating, we should have big quotes there. Uh, we all know what that's all about. The companies spend twice as much on advertising as research and development, and the ads that they run are notoriously inaccurate, overstating the benefits, understating the risks, and citing unverifiable evidence. According to Campbell, things are likely to get worse. The drug companies take in $289 billion a year in revenue, and one of the ways they intend to increase sales is to start targeting people who aren't yet sick. The campaign that you see on TV all the time to start taking an aspirin a day to prevent a heart attack is a good example. Supplements and poly pills and all kinds of other products will be developed aimed at the not yet sick market. Drug companies in the medical profession claim that lifestyle changes aren't sustainable and they don't work, and they cite studies in which participants don't make meaningful or significant change to their diets, and of course the outcomes aren't very good. Campbell rightly points out that the supplement business is no different. In fact, in some ways it's worse. It uses the same techniques used by the drug companies, cherry-picking research studies to back their claims and focusing on minor short-term changes in biomarkers to promote their products. So I'll stop there, and, and on Thursday we'll talk about why the scientific community continues to buy in to this uh, line of thinking and um, uh, continue on with reviewing this great book. So that's all for now. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday.